Why, why now? What, why, is, why is now the right time for more Matrix? Whoa. Um. This is your last chance, dear viewer. After this, there is no going back. I mean, technically, you can stop watching the video whenever you want, but you know what I mean. You take the blue pill, and this video ends. Okay, it doesn't end, you just stop watching, but whatever. You keep browsing YouTube, believing whatever you want to believe about how The Matrix Resurrections is a confusing and confused, a sloppily written yet insufferably pretentious, preachy yet morally bankrupt dumpster fire of a story with uninspired action, mediocre performances, and a terrible soundtrack. I think I heard a shot! Or you take the red pill. You stay in the video and I tell you what I feel about The Matrix Resurrections using charged language and emotionally manipulative music. The choice is yours. And remember, all I'm offering is the truth. And the truth is... This video is sponsored by Flickly. Flickly is taking the crypto world by storm with their investment opportunities designed specifically for Scorsese approved cinema lovers like you and me. If you love cinema, and if you've ever wanted to own a piece of cinematic history, then Flickly is the service for you. Flickly takes the idea of every frame of painting to the next level by allowing investors and cinephiles to figuratively own frames from their favorite movies. Here's how it works. The cinema experts at Flickly take meticulous care, combing through classic films from all corners of the world to find only the most cinematic frames of purest artistic vision. They then mint those frames into premium NFTs and auction them off on Flickly's completely, totally, 100% secure, we promise, online auction house. Every week there's a new opportunity to invest in your love of classic cinema by bidding on blockchain protected data points on a private server that correspond to individual frames from some of the most iconic movies of all time. Now when Flickly reached out to me to sponsor this video, I couldn't have been happier because let me tell you guys, I love this service. Just last week I won an intense bidding war over this beautiful cinematic frame from my favorite flick. Spider-Man 2. But it's not just me. Good friend of the channel, Hugh, from I'm a Lover, Not a Fighter Media, just picked up this absolute beauty of Gurgi from the Black Cauldron. Say hi, Hugh. Hey guys, what's up? It's your boy, I'm a Lover, Not a Fighter Media here, asking you to please not screenshot this, okay? I paid a lot of money for this frame. I had to take a second mortgage on my house. I really need this to take off. Please don't screenshot it. NFT theft is a real problem. All right, it's not funny. It's not a joke. People get hurt. Just please, please don't screenshot it. Please. Thanks, you. Auctions begin every week, Monday at 9 a.m. Beijing time and close 12 p.m. on the same day. This week's auction will feature this absolutely action-packed frame from the fifth installment in Hasbro Cinematic Universe, Transformers The Last Night. Also, this exquisite end credits frame from the Warner Brothers classic dramedy film My Dog Skip. And in honor of today's video, Flickly has generously decided to include this stunning frame from the 1972 B-movie classic Night of the Lepus, which Matrix superfans will recognize as the movie playing on the TV in the Oracle's apartment. Whoa. So what are you waiting for, guys? Start using Flickly today. Just go to flickly.cn slash capital O and enter the code O to receive 500 Scorsese bucks free towards your first bid. What's up, guys? How's it going? Hope you're well. Before we talk about The Matrix Resurrections, and oh boy is there a lot to talk about, I want to tell you a quick story about my personal life that's only tangentially related to the subject of this video because this is how I learned to write essays in high school and I literally don't know any other way. You see, back in the early 2000s or so, when I was just a goofy middle school kid from suburban Maryland, I went to a friend's birthday party. Now what I didn't know ahead of time was that this friend had rented The Matrix on DVD. Now the movie had been all the rage for a couple of years now, but we had never had the chance to see it because it was rated R and we weren't old enough. Needless to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, we were all incredibly pumped for this movie. The tremendous and ubiquitous hype surrounding The Matrix coupled with the distinct adolescent joy of getting away with watching something you're not supposed to see was the perfect setup for a once-in-a-lifetime cinematic experience. 
Unfortunately, I ended up getting too scared to keep watching within the first five minutes and had to leave the room. But I did end up seeing the movie years later, and boy, let me tell you, it was really good. But you already know that. It's the frickin' Matrix. You know it's great. I know it's great. Everyone knows it's great. It blew us all away when it came out. It made $427 million on a $63 million budget, and it captured the imaginations of movie fans across the world. Now we could talk about the cool as hell action scenes and fight choreography, the thought-provoking philosophical ideas embodied in the film's premise, and the incredible deftness of the film's pacing and tightness of its script. Or we could talk about the captivating performances, Bill Pope's stylish cinematography, and the film's exhilarating soundtrack. But really, I think the most important aspect of the film is that it was original. No one had ever seen a movie like it before. It was different. It was novel. It was unique. At the end of the day, when you get down to it, when you boil it down to its essence, what really made the original Matrix original was that it was original. Ah, the Matrix sequels. For the almost two decades since they came out, the popular consensus has been that they are simply bad movies. They strayed too far from what people liked about the original. They were unnecessary additions to a story that already had a really great ending. They couldn't recapture the magic of the first movie, and as a result, they were a massive disappointment to audiences. But more recently, thanks to some great video essays from some of my close friends and colleagues, people have begun to reevaluate Reloaded and Revolutions, and have started to appreciate their strengths despite their flaws. And don't get me wrong, these movies are flawed, but they have more going for them than they often get credit for. And many of the criticisms they receive are just bogus, dude. As I'm sure you've heard before, the popular meme response of these Matrix sequels was to pretend they didn't exist. Man, The Matrix sure is a good movie. Good thing they never ruined it with any lame sequels. <laughs> now, setting aside how obviously problematic it is to silence trans creators like the Wachowskis in this way, it also demonstrates how little these feeble-minded people understood the original. As we proved definitively earlier, what really made the original original is that it was original, and lamenting all the ways two and three differed from one is missing that point entirely. Like I said before, these movies are flawed, but for the exact opposite reasons people often assume. Reloaded and Revolutions are flawed not for when they differ too much from the original, but for when they try too hard to imitate what worked about the original. The action scenes are still pretty fun and cool for the most part, but where's the originality there? We've already seen cool Matrix action sequences and set pieces. There's nothing challenging, thought-provoking, or revolutionary about doing the same thing over and over again. But those dense discussions of French philosophy, the confounding exposition and lore dumps, now that's cinema, baby. The weird, dirty cave orgy, cinema. The comical amount of Agent Smith copies dogpiling Neo, cinema. The albino dreadlocked ghost twins, cinema. All these things are unique, bold, and most importantly, original. It's these aspects of Reloaded and Revolutions that truly capture the subversive and groundbreaking spirit of the original by not conforming to the spirit of the original. Now listen, maybe you love Reloaded and Revolutions, and that's totally valid. I would never try to take away someone's personal experience with a movie. And maybe you hate Reloaded and Revolutions, and that's actually not valid at all, and maybe you should go outside and touch some grass. But for me personally, I wish they went all in on the challenging, thought-provoking stuff that totally subverts the first film. Because being challenging and subversive is what made the first film so freaking cool. But alas, that isn't what we got. And maybe we weren't ready for that at the time, you know? Maybe the Wachowskis themselves weren't ready to go there just yet. Maybe, just maybe, the best Matrix sequel was yet to come. Fast forward nearly 20 years and Hollywood has become completely saturated by soulless cash grab sequels, remakes, and reboots. No franchise or intellectual property is safe from the avarice and greed of a studio system that prioritizes profits over artistic vision. If it was successful, you can bet your ass they're gonna keep milking it until the well runs dry and then keep milking it some more. These kinds of movies aren't made by passionate filmmakers, singular artistic voices, creators with an unrelenting need to tell their story. 
like me. These movies are made by committee, by suits at a giant corporate conglomerate who only care about making money. And honestly, that's pretty sad. These movies are just products, theme park rides, vehicles for weaponized nostalgia and cheap thrills. <laughs> Simply put, they're just not cinema. Except for all the ones I like. Anyway, it's in this climate that Lana and Lily Wachowski were given an ultimatum by the suits at Warner Brothers. By all accounts, the Wachowskis had been getting pressure to make another Matrix movie for years at this point, but they weren't interested. So Warner Brothers finally told them, We're gonna make another Matrix movie whether you like it or not, so you can either be a part of it or we can make it without you. The choice is yours. You call this a choice? But what kind of choice is that? Make another movie for us or we're gonna make it without you and have our way with your story, your creative vision, your deeply personal works of art. That's not a choice at all. The choice is an illusion. And while Lily Wachowski did choose to let Warner Brothers make the movie without her, Lana wasn't about to let that happen. So, Lana decided to make The Matrix 4. And she did it in the most subversive, punk rock way possible, using the opportunity to make a super meta and self-aware satire of legacy sequels, the modern Hollywood landscape, and the very studio that forced her to make this movie in the first place. I'm sure you can understand why our beloved parent company, Warner Brothers, has decided to make a sequel to the trilogy. What? They informed me they're gonna do it with or without us. I thought they couldn't do that. <sighs> oh, they can. Fuck yeah, Lana, way to stick it to the man, bro. Now some of you are probably thinking to yourself, but didn't Warner Brothers agree to finance and promote Lana's satirical film that makes fun of them? They could have rejected her vision and went ahead with the project with someone else at the helm if they really wanted to. Wouldn't that mean they completely agreed to and supported her vision? Now first of all, her original vision was to not be coerced by a greedy corporation into continuing to make Matrix movies, okay? So let's get that clear. But secondly, Lana's subversion didn't stop there. Lana, in her brilliance, understood that fully committing to the idea of making The Matrix 4 as an ironic, cynical, and biting satire of legacy sequels could potentially result in a critically and financially successful film. And you might think that sounds like something she'd want, right? Except that all that would mean is that Warner Brothers would have every reason to keep milking the franchise even more. So in order to sabotage Warner Brothers' hopes and dreams for the future lucrativity of The Matrix brand, Lana took the subversion even further by by not fully committing to the satirical approach and abandoning it halfway through the movie, making the film unsatisfying, challenging, and frustrating not just to audiences who wanted a genuinely and unironically good sequel to The Matrix, but also to the people who liked the cynical, ironic meta critique. And it worked. The movie flopped just the way she hoped it would. And that's the true brilliance of this movie. By disappointing audiences and deliberately undermining The Matrix as a brand and as an intellectual property in order to subvert the suits at Warner Brothers, Lana, counterintuitively, ended up making a Matrix sequel that actually manages to truly capture the true spirit of the original's originality. Anyway, maybe it's because I'm an artist, a filmmaker, a storyteller who would love to have carte blanche to do whatever I want without compromise or consideration to the business side of filmmaking that I fully support Lana's deliberate subversion and undermining of Warner Brothers' corporate interests. Filmmakers should never be forced to compromise their artistic purity to appease the corporation spending millions of dollars to fund their films. Why should the people paying for it be given any consideration? As a creator myself, I'm always going to be on the side of the original creator and their actual, real, pure artistic vision. Unless their name is John Watts, in which case they don't have a vision. And if I have to choose as an audience member, as a cinema lover, as a kid who eats, sleeps, and breathes movies, I'll take a cynical middle finger of a movie, an intentional mess of a story, a deliberate sabotage of an intellectual property made by the original creator, over literally anything made by committee, no matter how good it is. Unfortunately and predictably, Lana's genius was ignored by many so-called critics who only care about plot, and I must say that it's been incredibly frustrating and disappointing for me seeing so many people talk about the elements of the movie that don't work, because the reasons they think those elements don't work are the exact reasons I believe they do work. Criticisms like, Okay, right off the bat, Neo's modal program makes no sense. Apparently, he built a program that's meant to evolve a Morpheus-Agent-Smith hybrid program, whatever that means, 
by looping a facsimile of the opening sequence of The Matrix over and over again. You're thinking this model is a loop or treadmill? Some sort of sequencer evolving a program to do what? I don't know. Why? Well, the movie wants us to assume that Neo hoped Morpheus Smith would eventually discover that this modal program wasn't the real world. And suddenly I understood. This is not the real world. Would stumble randomly into human beings who themselves randomly stumbled into this modal. Seek, I'm in. Captain. You were right. The skylight was a window pane. But that's serious interference. Weird. It's some kind of modal. Subvert his bad guy programming just because. My job is to hunt down and destroy sentients like you. And yet. Here we are. Here we are. And then decide to come rescue Neo from his life that deep down, Neo suspects might not be the real world. Quite convoluted and contrived if you ask me, but setting that aside, how does this modal even work? Morpheus Smith makes it clear that he's aware that he's an AI. Do you understand that you are digital sentience? I know what I am. But he also says that he had to wake up and realize that this program wasn't the real world. I saw this pattern. We can't see it, but we're all trapped inside these strange repeating loops. Somehow I saw it in the mirror. And suddenly I understood. This is not the real world. Surely, if this is a machine learning program that loops the same scenarios over and over, Morpheus Smith would retain the memories of each loop. How would he ever be led to believe that this loop program was the real world? How was he simultaneously aware that he's a sentient computer program, but also not aware that he's in a computer program? That makes no sense. Yeah. I know. Furthermore, when Bugs and Morpheus Smith finally come to free Neo from this new Matrix, Bugs tells Neo that they've suspected he was still alive somehow, and so they've been looking for him for decades. Why did it take 20 years to find me? It took a lot longer than that. It's been over 60 years. What? Neo, quite fairly, asks what took them so long to find him, and Bugs says they couldn't find him all that time because the new Matrix disguised his appearance. I've been at a company making a game called The Matrix. Doesn't seem like they were trying to hide anything. We've been checking that company for years. We screened every Thomas Anderson we found. What we didn't understand was that they could alter your DSI. This is how you look to yourself. And this is how everyone else sees you. Are we actually meant to believe that Bugs and others knew that there was a game designer in this new Matrix named Thomas Anderson, which they know was Neo's original name? Holy shit. And that this Thomas Anderson designed and produced a game called The Matrix. This is footage from your game. Which happens to exactly resemble the real events of Neo's life, and yet when they investigated this Thomas Anderson and saw that he didn't look like Keanu Reeves, they just assumed, ah crap, this can't be Neo because he doesn't look right. I guess we better keep looking. Really? They can't fathom the idea that a computer-generated illusion world could possibly alter someone's appearance. Really. Neo is so lucky that these incredibly stupid people just happened to stumble into his modal program somehow, because otherwise they never would have found him. Yeah, I know. And what the actual hell is up with Neil Patrick Harris's The Analyst in this movie? Neo, the one guy who just kept breaking matrix after matrix after matrix, was dead and out of the picture at the end of Revolutions, as was Trinity. So why would Neil Patrick Harris decide to bring them back to life? He says that it was crazy expensive to resurrect them. Resurrecting you both was crazy expensive. Like renovating a house. Took twice as long, cost twice as much. He says that it took years to get the two of them operational again. We worked for years trying to activate your source code. And only then did he discover that keeping the two of them close, but not too close, produced unprecedented levels of energy. As long as I managed to keep you close, but not too close, I discovered something incredible. I've been setting productivity records every year since I took over. Apparently, the two of them produce so much energy that somehow the whole new system completely and totally relies on the two of them. The key to it all? You. And her. 
to the point that they will have to reset the entire Matrix back to the previous version if either one of them escapes. Neo's escape has destabilized the Matrix. The anomaly draws its current from Trinity alone now. A failsafe has been triggered to reset the Matrix back to the previous version. How is it even possible that Neo and Trinity's physical bodies, that are not superhuman at all by the way, produce so much energy that they make the rest of humanity basically irrelevant to the functionality of the system? But even ignoring that absurdity, he didn't know before resurrecting them that keeping them just close enough together, but not close enough to bond, would generate unprecedented levels of energy. How could he know that? So why spend all that time and money trying to resurrect them in the first place? Resurrecting them just creates an insane amount of risk, especially if you're allowing them to retain their memories. Free your mind. It's not like Neo only has vague recollections or subconscious intuitions about his past, either. He remembers everything so clearly that he can recreate it in perfect, photorealistic detail for the Matrix video game. On the other hand, Trinity does seem to only have vague recollections and subconscious intuitions about her past. Why? Why keep Neo's memories intact? Just so he can make the Matrix video game? Is that really the only reason? Speaking of which, it's certainly very odd that Neil Patrick Harris would design this new Matrix such that Neo is a genius game developer, given that it directly leads to Neo using the skills and tools at his disposal to create artificial intelligence of his own, which directly leads to him being freed from the Matrix all over again. Seems like a really stupid idea. But that aside, how exactly was Neil Patrick Harris unable to prevent this from happening? I kept such a close eye on you. And still you found a way out. Clever monkey using that moto. How much control does the analyst even have over this new Matrix? We see that he can move faster than anyone or anything has ever moved in any previous movie, demonstrating that he has an incredible amount of power. Oh, no use. You can't beat time. This rewind is happening faster than you can blink. Furthermore, when Agent Smith inexplicably wakes up in this scene, Mr. Anderson! and is moments away from killing Neo, Neo suddenly finds himself in Neil Patrick Harris's office as if it was all a delusional episode. But it wasn't a delusion. We know that it definitely happened. After our first contact went so badly, we thought elements from your past might help ease you into the present. So how the hell did he get from here to here? I see no other explanation besides that Neil Patrick Harris can reset people, environments, and possibly even the entire new Matrix at will. The movie shows us that the analyst is so powerful that the threat he poses is greater than any we have ever seen, which you would think raises the stakes because it will be incredibly difficult for our heroes to defeat him, right? wrong. Later in the movie, he consistently forgets that he has all this unbelievable power to manipulate and control this world, and just stands there like an incompetent buffoon as Neo and Trinity reach for each other, as if he's powerless to do anything about it. Stop them! And at the end, when Neo and Trinity go to confront him, Trinity mercilessly beats the shit out of him and humiliates him while he just stands there and takes it. What the hell is this? Neil Patrick Harris's entire premise for this new Matrix is founded on a multitude of stupid ideas, and his handling of the threats posed by our main characters is confoundingly idiotic and cartoonishly inept. Neil Patrick Harris's incompetence literally undermines everything about this story. It undermines the premise, the central conflict and stakes, and the resolution. It undermines everything. Yeah. I know. All of that is true, but it doesn't matter. And also, that's the whole point. This movie gives a big, meaty middle finger to the idea that movies are supposed to make sense. We just start saying, and then this could, and this could happen. And somebody else says, oh my god, and then this could happen. What about if this happened? We never say no. So stop trying to make it make sense. Don't try to understand it, just feel it. Listen, I'm not saying to turn your brain off. The body cannot live without the mind. I'm just saying that the best attitude to have when watching this movie is no thoughts, just vibes. Vibe. And besides, it's meant to be that way, therefore it's good. This is pretty simple stuff, and yet somehow so-called critics, 
so-called college film professors and so-called parents seem to have a hard time grasping it, okay? That shot was out of focus on purpose, all right? It's not a mistake, it's intentional. You guys just don't understand my vision. Anyway, now that that's out of the way, we can actually assess the movie on its own terms and we can talk about all the interesting ideas that this movie has to offer. Now, one thing about this movie that I was absolutely thrilled to see was that Lana and co-writers David Mitchell and Alexander Hammond Ham made it a top priority to reclaim the Matrix from the right wing. Given that the right had literally kidnapped the metaphor of the red pill, trivialized it, and used it to be total fascist Nazi pieces of shit, one might say that the writers of this film had two choices in how to respond. On the one hand, they could accept that people who don't share their political views like the movie and find it meaningful and come to see the universal appeal of the original film as a good thing. But on the other hand, they could see this for what it really is. An appropriation, a theft, a bastardization of everything they believe and hold dear, and use the opportunity to do the right thing and say, no, this movie belongs to the left and you can't have it. <laughs> Personally, I love that this film doesn't fall into the trap of making a moral equivalence between both sides, and that it's unapologetic about declaring the moral superiority of one side over the other. Another thing I love about this movie is that it presents a more nuanced view of the two sides of the conflict between the humans and the machines. Zion was stuck in the past, stuck in war, stuck in a matrix of its own. They believed that it had to be us or them. This city was built by us and them. Gone is the frankly naive and, let's face it, overly simplistic black and white worldview of the first film that pits all humans versus all machines. For the first time, this movie shows us that there are machines that don't want to enslave and control humanity. Machines are on our side now? They are sentients. The web they prefer to machines. And look how cute they are. Also, this movie rejects the idea that the only real victory for our heroes is a total victory over the machines. Instead of trying to bring down the entire matrix and causing more pointless and unnecessary conflict with the machines, instead of freeing every human being from the matrix when, frankly, some people just don't want to not be slaves. Not all seek to control, just as not all wish to be free. Our heroes decide to use their power to make the Matrix into a nicer, happier, and more empathetic place. I say, go for it. Remake it. Knock yourselves out. Paint the sky with rainbows. But here's the thing. The sheeple aren't going anywhere. We're not here to negotiate anything. We were on our way to remake your world. Change a few things. I kinda like the paint the sky with rainbows idea. That way, everybody wins. And I think that's great. It's nice and refreshing to see a big budget action movie franchise mature beyond the simplistic, binary thinking of its roots into a more complex, nuanced, and profound exploration of the deepest questions of what it means to be a hero, what it means to be an artist, what it means to be a human being. Which brings us to the trans allegory of it all. I wish you would fucking stop calling me that. I hate that name. My name is Trinity, and you better take your hands off of me. Now, let me be unequivocal about this, all right? Whether fanboys want to admit it or not, The Matrix has always been a trans metaphor. Thank you, thank you. And by directly contradicting the themes and lore of the original, the trans metaphor is made even more explicit in this movie. But you know what? I'm just a cis straight white guy who doesn't know anything about anything, so I'm gonna take a step back and let other trans, queer, and non-binary folks discuss that aspect of the movie instead. I know, I know, you were probably hoping to hear me go into this aspect of the film and talk about all the beautiful symbolism and allegorical meta-narrative thematics, but frankly, I'm afraid of the criticism I might get if I accidentally say anything heretical on the subject. Needless to say, I think the film is pretty openly critical of the gender binary. But I actually think the film's criticisms of binaries goes way deeper than that. See, the idea of binary choices and dualistic distinctions was central to the themes of the first film. The us versus them conflict between the humans and the machines, destiny and fate versus free will and self-determination, but perhaps most concretely of all, the red pill versus the blue pill. Neo was presented with the binary choice between continuing to live in the blissful ignorance of the Matrix illusion, or to live in the cold, hard truth that is the desert of the real. 
And sure, you could say this choice made for a supremely engaging and compelling narrative. Sure, you could say that it perfectly embodied the archetypal hero's journey story. Sure, you could say it tapped into something fundamental about the human experience. But times have changed, and that sort of childish binary thinking simply won't fly anymore. As Lana so astutely points out in Resurrections, the choice between the red pill and the blue pill is actually no choice at all. Except for when it is. You call this a choice? Oh, honestly, when somebody offered me these things, I went off of binary conceptions of the world and said that there was no way I was following some symbolic reduction in my life. And the woman with the pills laughed because I was missing the point. The choice is an illusion. You already know what you have to do. You see, the fact that New Morpheus chose the red pill because it was an easy choice for him to take the red pill makes the fact that he chose to take the red pill not a choice at all. The choice is an illusion. But later in the film, Neo is first offered only the red pill because the choice is an illusion, and he doesn't take it, instead choosing to stay inside the illusion and believe that this is all a delusion. Uh oh. No. No, 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 whoa, no. whoa, whoa, what do you mean, no? You wanted this, you did this, this was your idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Therefore, the choice isn't an illusion. When New Morpheus comes to break Neo out of jail, he tells Neo that he can stay there and remain meekly incarcerated, or bust the hell out of there and go find Trinity. They're standing by, waiting for you to make the choice to remain meekly incarcerated, or bust the hell out of here and go and find Trinity. But that ain't a choice. Neo was always going to make the choice to go find Trinity, therefore the choice is an illusion. But also, in the final act, every single person going on the mission to free Trinity is quite concerned that she might not choose the red pill, and they all seriously fear that she might choose the blue pill instead. This is a tough question, Neo, but it has to be asked. What if she's happy where she is? She wasn't always necessarily going to choose the red pill, otherwise we might not have had any stakes. Therefore, the choice isn't an illusion. Now you might say that this seems contradictory, right? Like Lana's trying to have her cake and eat it too. And uh, yeah, she is. That's like the whole point. The distinction between having your cake and eating it too is exactly the kind of false binary that Resurrection seeks to criticize. You see, this movie brilliantly explodes the whole idea of binary choices. Good versus bad, right versus wrong, chocolate versus vanilla by refusing to be pigeonholed by the expectations that fans, studios, and our society as a whole places on movies like this. Lana said, no, I'm not going to choose between resurrecting beloved characters to give them a happy ending and cynically mocking and sneering at the entire movie industry for its obsession with nostalgia. I'm going to do both. I'm not going to choose between jerking off to the importance of the original trilogy and deliberately contradicting and undermining fundamental aspects of it when it suits me. I'm going to do both. I'm not going to choose between making an earnest attempt at crafting a good film and making something deliberately unsatisfying as a fuck you to the studio for forcing me to make this movie in the first place. I'm going to do both. And she did. And it fucking rules. This movie tears down the illusion of the binary between good and bad by being bad and good at the same time. And that makes it good. Let's take a step back. Let's set aside all the social commentary and deep meta-narrative thematics for a moment. All that stuff is great, don't get me wrong, but amidst all that sort of talk, it's easy to lose sight of what's really important in all of this. And that's my emotions. There's this moment towards the end of the movie that really got to me. You see, when Neo and Trinity were resurrected by the Analyst and placed back into the new Matrix, they reached for each other, but didn't touch fingers. And at the climax of the movie, when against all odds they reach for each other once again, this time, they touch fingers. When I saw this moment at home on the couch with my girlfriend, I started getting choked up. And unconsciously, as if she could sense what I was feeling, my girlfriend reached her hand out to mine, and we touched fingers. I began to sob, to weep uncontrollably, to blubber like an idiot. I don't even remember the last 10 minutes of the movie. I was just so moved by the raw human emotion of that moment. It's like Lana herself reached through the screen, through the absolute swamp that film discourse has become in the years since The Matrix first released, past all the hordes of brain-dead man-babies crying that this movie should never have been made, across the seemingly infinite chasm that is the metaphor I'm using for how divided and isolated we've become in our modern world. She reached out to me. 
and we touched fingers. The Matrix Resurrections broke me. And it was beautiful. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this video about how The Matrix Resurrections broke me. Did it break you too? Let me know down in the comments. Here are some other videos about movies that also broke me. Am I ever not broken? I don't know. Maybe not. And maybe that's okay. Alright, that's all I got for you guys today. Toodaloo! You have to be a master filmmaker to make a film like this. Period. Thank <laughs> you.